This lecture will cover Econococcus granulosus and Multilocularis, the dog tapeworms. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives for Econococcus are for you to understand the life cycle of these worms and therefore how to break them, know who gets the infection and why, and make a diagnosis, recognize the clinical presentation of hydatid disease, and know how to confirm your suspicion. And as always, become familiar with treatment options, in this case, both medical and surgical management options. This is the tree of life. Uh, Econococcus are the last of the cestodes, or tapeworms, that we will talk about. And remember, these are the only worms in which humans are always intermediate hosts. So this is what happens in nature. The cycle starts when a dog consumes the organs, or offal, especially the liver, of sheep or cows, or any other hoofed mammal. If we take a look at the liver, we can see that it contains cysts. They're called hydatid cysts. And if we zoom in, you can see that there's a protective layer on the outside and a germinal membrane on the inside. The job of that germinal membrane is to bud off new daughter cysts, or brood capsules. And inside each one of these capsules is the head of a tapeworm. It's folded in on itself, invaginated, and when it's consumed by the dog and it gets to the dog's intestines, it pops open and hatches, evaginates, and turns into a teeny tiny tapeworm. In fact, that tapeworm will mature into a worm that looks kind of like other tapeworms we've talked about, but it's very, very small. It's less than a centimeter in length when it's done, unlike the others, which are many meters long. And that particular worm will stay inside the gut of the dog and produce eggs, which are excreted into the environment every time the dog poops. If a sheep comes along and eats grass contaminated by the dog poop, the cyst will form inside that sheep. So the question, of course, that comes up is, since you're a medical doctor, not a veterinarian, what happens when a human being eats the egg instead of a sheep? And the answer is the same exact thing. In effect, the human becomes the sheep. The human will become encysted. And most of these cysts will form in the liver. That only makes good sense. The eggs have to get out of the gut. They usually leave the gut and get swept up by the portal blood into the liver. But they can make their way into any other body compartment in the belly, the kidneys, the brain, even the bone marrow can become encysted in rare cases. This is a big deal because uh, that leads to a condition called hydatid disease. Hydatid disease is a zoonosis. We share it with dogs. You get it through fecal oral transmission, consuming dog feces. Humans are dead-end hosts unless a dog eats our corpses after we die. The concept is that this happens any place on planet Earth where there are dogs, not just any dogs, dogs that are eating the uncooked guts of ungulates, the entrails, or offal. Uh, and that doesn't sound like a healthy thing to do, but it actually works out well for many farmers, right? Because they need the dogs to protect the sheep. When they slaughter the sheep, they don't need the guts. The dogs need the protein. It's a tidy little story, except if there's cysts in those guts, because then the dog will perpetuate that cycle. And of course, if you then consume dog feces, you yourself will become encysted. So this happens millions of times. There's both a tropical cycle and also a northern cycle. We see that in my practice here in Seattle, working with people who come from Alaska and have been consumed not with dog feces, but wolf feces or coyote feces as they fed on insisted moose or elk or caribou. The most prominent place where you'll see this infection is definitely in the steppes of Central Asia. So, Econococcus granulosis, how does it present? Most people with Econococcosis do not have symptoms. The cysts are merely dormant and well tolerated. But some people will develop true symptomatic disease, hydatid disease. It's usually the liver, can go anyplace else it chooses, and of course the way it presents will depend on the size and location of those cysts. Here's a patient of mine who acquired this as a young girl in Uzbekistan. Now, 50 years later, this thing has grown uh, slowly over time until it's about the size of, uh, well, about the size of a football, I suppose, and it has physically destroyed and displaced the liver. Now, she still has liver function, but she has a lot of belly pain for obvious reasons. And if this cyst had traveled to her brain, she could have seizures. If it went to the eyeball, it could cause blindness. If it went to the spinal cord, she could have paralysis, etc. So that's the issue, right? There's the cyst and what it does when it's intact. But those cysts are fragile. They may actually pop. And when they rupture, they can cause one of two issues. First of all, the patient may have anaphylaxis. That's the sudden, robust 
uh, immediate type hypersensitivity response to a huge load of antigens, what we call the hydatid sand, all the debris that sits in the bottom of these hydatid cysts. If that is suddenly exposed to the host immune system, there may be a terrible anaphylactic response. And second of all, if the patient gets through that process, the germinal tissue in the sand may actually settle out in other tissues and start to grow into new cysts. This is what we call seeding of a body compartment, for example, the peritoneal cavity, with new fresh cysts, and that is obviously a bad thing too. So how will you make a diagnosis of egranulosis? Get a history. Uh, does your patient have intimate contact with dogs that have eaten the uncooked entrails of ungulates? Some people do, some people don't. You may also be able to confirm your suspicion by taking a picture. The top frame here shows you a plain chest x-ray in a patient who has uh, pulmonary cysts that are old and have calcified over time. More commonly, this will be a belly presentation. CT scan or ultrasound will give you the look uh, that you want to see uh, there. These patients may or may not have eosinophils. Often they do not. It depends on how much the cysts leak and how much of their antigens they show to the host immune system. I do send serology on these patients. I'm very pleased to see them when they're positive. But again, because sometimes these cysts are really truly walled off and protected from the host immune system, the negative predictive value of serology is not reliable. What do we do if we've made a diagnosis of echinococcosis? First of all, we kill the parasites. So albendazole is more effective against the germinal membrane than praziquantel, which is more effective against the protoscolices themselves. But unfortunately, these drugs do not penetrate well into the cyst. The cyst is relatively protected from the bloodstream, and so there's a technique called PAIR, puncture, aspirate, inject, and re-aspirate. In this technique, a needle is used to suck out as much of the hydatid juice as we can. We then uh, inject uh, a protoscolicidal agent, such as hypertonic saline, or albendazole uh, in solution. We let it sit there for a half hour and then we suck out that juice again. In severe cases we may have to operate on these patients but that's a problem because if we spill that hydatid sand into the local tissue of course allergy is a risk and seeding of that tissue is also a risk. So this is the patient whose CT scan I showed you earlier. She was not a candidate for pear because her cyst was enormous, it was complicated, and it involved the inferior vena cava she required open surgery. This is the surface of her liver. It was firm uh, and you can see the cysts underneath the capsule pushing up against it. One of those cysts has been opened here and we can see a daughter cyst, uh, that little white piece of tissue sort of floating to the top. Now around the incision on the surface of the liver you can see this gauze. Those are lap pads and they have been soaked with a very hypertonic 20 percent sodium chloride solution. The concept is if any of the fluid from inside that cyst spills out into the peritoneum, it should be inactivated in the presence of that highly hypertonic solution, thus preventing it from setting up uh, further seeding of the peritoneum. Inside the fluid, she had not only these free-floating hooklets showing that she had some degenerated protoscolices, but also some very viable alive protoscolices just waiting to get into the intestines of a dog. In terms of breaking the transmission cycle, we always want to cook the meat before we feed it to dogs. We do have a way to treat the dogs themselves, to deworm them, and the last line of defense is always to wash your hands after you've played with Fido before you eat your meal. So that's egranulosis. There's also an infection called Echinococcus multilocularis. This is even worse. It's less common. We see it more in the northern hemisphere than in the tropics. It's usually between foxes and voles or other uh, little furry creatures that they eat. It's like Echinococcus granulosis, except that those daughter cysts are never bound up within the wall of a cyst. Instead, they spread outwards into the tissue of the patient in an alveolar pattern, and that is incredibly destructive. It's essentially just like having liver cancer. It grows along over time, and unless it is operated on early, these patients uh, will do very, very poorly. Here's a vole at autopsy that is itself filled with uh, these cysts threading, spreading through its body. If you consume food that has been contaminated with fox poop, you will yourself become infected and human liver doesn't do well when it is full of these alveolar cysts. On microscopy, we can see that each one of them is packed to the gills with more protoscolices waiting to be consumed by the next fox that comes along. 
So those are my key concepts for echinococcosis. These are dog tapeworms. They're cestodes, uh, and there's a dog ungulate cycle. Humans get infected when they consume the feces of dogs or foxes. The epidemiology is any place where dogs are eating infected entrails or where foxes are eating infected voles. In hydatid disease with echinococcus granulosus, we have the gradual growth of cysts, mostly in the liver and the lungs. And in alveolar disease, Econococcus multilocularis, it's a gradual liver destruction not bound up within cysts. We'll make a diagnosis by taking a picture, CT scan, ultrasound, plain film, and there is a serology that's available too. We treat these people with worm medications, and in the case of hydatid disease, we can puncture, aspirate, re-inject, and then re-aspirate or pair these patients. If we have to do surgery, we can, but we have to be careful not to allow spillage of the hydatid fluid into the belly. We prevent this by cooking dog food, deworming dogs, and please always wash your hands after you come into contact with dog feces. Thank you for your attention.